Have you ever jumped straight into a leaco question where you write some solid, solid code where everything makes sense, but when you start to run it against the test cases, your code breaks, you make some changes, your code breaks again, make some more changes, and it keeps breaking and breaking until finally, after 25 submissions, you finally get an accepted solution? If that sounds familiar, then this video was literally made for you. Over the next few minutes, I'll be going over exactly how to tackle any leaco problem from start to finish to ensure that you pass all of your technical interviews. The first thing I like to do is properly read through the entire problem description to get a better understanding of the problem and work through the examples in my head to see if I've understood the problem well enough to continue. I also like to take a look at the constraints because you see the specific edge cases you have to work with if there are any. After that, it's really important to design your solution either through pseudocode or through thorough diagrams because if you start coding immediately without thinking through the problem, there will inevitably be things you didn't plan for and you'll have to keep modifying your code to the end of time, making it look uglier and uglier to get a working solution. When I was preparing for interviews, I bought a chalkboard to create these diagrams on because back then in-person interviews were usually conducted with a whiteboard and I wanted to simulate the real interview as much as possible. But these days it seems like more and more interviews are conducted remotely, so writing pseudocode on your computer is good enough. After you've properly created pseudocode and worked through the example test cases through your pseudocode, go ahead and write it out. The purpose of doing leak code problems in this manner is to avoid constant revisions the whole time. At first, it felt really weird to me to not start coding right away because after all, you have to write code to complete the problem. And so it stood to reason that by not coding, you were delaying your solution. But that is 100% the wrong way to look at it because if you don't go into battle with a plan, you're going to be scrambling the second something unforeseen happens. Okay, so we're going to take a look at question number 200, number of islands. This is a pretty straightforward, simple problem. It's tagged as an Amazon interview question and it's from the blind 75 list. If you haven't tried those questions out, it's a curated list of the best questions for studying interviews. So for this question, we have an M by N 2D grid where a one represents land and a zero represents water and we have to return the number of islands where an island is defined as land that is connected both horizontally and vertically. So land being diagonal from each other would count as two separate islands unless they were connected in some other way. So in the first example you can see there's one clear island with the rest of the slots as zeros and because the description says you can assume all four sides of the grid can be considered as water, this is an island. The second example has three islands because remember the diagonals don't count as islands if they're not connected horizontally or vertically. Taking a look at the constraints M stands for the amount of rows in the grid, while N stands for the amount of columns in the grid. M and N are both greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 300, so we don't have to worry about a case where the input is an empty grid or where there are no columns. Now that we've gotten a good sense of the problem, let's go ahead and design a solution. Since we're dealing with graphs, it's important to think about what graph algorithms are helpful in solving leak code questions. Algorithms that come to mind are depth first search, breadth first search, topological sort. So in this problem, it's really simple to identify where there is an island. It's just when there is a one in the grid. So then the main objective is to ensure that we don't double count islands because if there's land right next to each other and we have to iterate through all of the different coordinates in the grid, we're going to eventually iterate over every single one of that island's land and we only want to count that landform one time. So two things that we need to make sure of are our number of islands, of course, because that's what we're going to return in the end and also a hash set of known or already counted land squares in order to avoid double counting islands. So how do we populate this hash set of known land coordinates? I think the search algorithms breadth first and depth first search work well because we have to search for all the land squares in the entire grid each time we encounter unique land and populate the hash set with all the coordinates of that island so we don't double count any island as I said before. I usually like to go with breadth first search because depth first search can require recursion and recursion is kind of nasty. Okay, so we've established which algorithm we're going to use. Let's take a crack at writing some pseudocode. We're going to have to iterate through the entire grid and a simple way to do that is through nested for loops. One to iterate through all of the rows and the nested for loop to iterate through each of the columns within each of the rows. So we want to conduct a breadth first search every time we encounter a new unique island. So we should create a case for when that doesn't happen. Or in other words, when we encounter water or an already encountered land square, aka when the coordinate we're currently looking at is already in the known land hash set. And we want to continue here so that we skip the rest of the inner loops code and start the next iteration. If this condition does not evaluate to true, we know that the current coordinates are a unique new island, so we need to both add the coordinates to the land hash set and start our breadth first search. The way I like to write BFS is through creating a list called Q and populating it with the initial coordinates and running a while Q loop. This while Q loop terminates when Q is empty, in other words, when the island in question is fully explored. So what should go on in that while loop? 
Well, we need to explore all adjacent lands of each of the individual land coordinates in that island. And we can do this by modifying the x and y coordinates by one or negative one. So in the queue, we pop off the first coordinate pair to get our y and our x coordinate. The y coordinate serves as which row we're looking into and the x coordinate serves as which index within that row we're looking at. After that, we run a loop that iterates four times to search through each of the four sides of that coordinate with each new x and y pair modified by dx and dy, and the new coordinates are new y and new x. Remember, we have to make sure this square has not already been explored, so we check for its presence in the land hash set. We also have to make sure that the coordinate is not out of bounds because, say, if the x and y pair is 0, 0, and you're checking for the space above it, you're going to end up with negative 1, 0, which does not exist. In both the cases where the land has already been explored and in the case where the coordinate is out of bounds, we continue. In other words, skipping the rest of this iteration. Next, if the coordinate is equal to one or if the space that we're exploring is a land space, we add the new coordinate to the land hash set and add the new coordinate to the end of the queue so its sides can be explored as well. By doing this, we can thoroughly explore every single land within a newly identified land square. After all of that island is fully explored, the queue remains empty and the loop terminates. Every time a unique island is identified, the breadth first search starts again. And then after all of the grid has been exhausted, then we return the final number of islands. Okay, so we've got a really good idea of solution design as well as pseudocode. Let's go ahead and turn this pseudocode into working code. So the first thing that we have to do is instantiate our number of islands to zero at the start and to instantiate an empty hash set for all of the land coordinates. Next, we're going to be working on these two rows. So instead of four row and four column, let's say for i in range length grid so for each of the columns and then we iterate for j in range length of the columns so for line number eight here instead of saying if already visited we can go ahead and say if the ordered pair i j is in land and instead of or zero we just say if grid at i j is equal to zero or equal to water the continue stays the same. And then for the unique new island code, let's go ahead and create the queue. It's pretty simple. So we just have to create an empty list, but then we put in our first ordered pair that we want to search through and search the sides of, which is i and j. Then we have to go ahead and add the ordered pair i, j into the hash set of known land coordinates so we don't double count. We also have to increment the number of islands by one here because we're encountering a new island. So now let's go ahead and write the breadth first search code. The code on line 17 stays the same and the way that we start off is our y and x coordinate is the ordered pair that's popped off of the queue at the front of the queue or at index zero. So the loop that starts on line 20 is the loop that runs four times and sets a new dy and dx every single time. It runs four times because we have to check whether the coordinates above, below, to the right, and to the left, if they're land or not. If they are land, then we have to add that coordinate to the queue to explore that coordinate sides. And we also have to add that coordinate into the known land hash set. So our directions array hasn't been instantiated yet. Let's go ahead and do that right now. So to find the above coordinate, we have to use negative one zero for dy dx. And then let's go ahead and put in the other directions as well. All right, so that's our directions array that we'll use for the loop on line 21 now. So on line 22, we have our new y and our new x coordinates. And for line 24, we have to figure out if we've already visited this coordinate or not, and also if it's out of bounds. For modifying visited already, it's pretty simple. We've already written code for that, which is new y, new x is in land. So the other thing that we have to tackle is if the new y, new x coordinates are out of bounds or not. So I think it makes sense to use a helper function right here because the code gets a tad messy. So let's go ahead and create that right here. So let's put in the y coordinate, the x coordinate, as well as the length of the grid and the length of the grids columns. All right, so now let's break from the main function to go ahead and write this helper function. So definition out of bounds, put in all of our parameters. All right, so what are the cases for when x or y are out of bounds? Well, let's start with just one coordinate first. So if there are five rows within the grid, those indexes are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if we're indexing into the array as something less than 0 or greater than 4, then we've got a problem, and it's out of bounds. So let's go ahead and write that. So if y is less than 0, or if it's greater than or equal to 
the length of the rows. Then we return true for it being out of bounds. We do the same thing with the x coordinate. And then at the end of the function, we return false if these conditions don't pass. All right, so now we can go ahead and write the final part of our function, the conditional in line 27. All right, so let's rewrite the code to determine if the new y, new x coordinate has a land square. All right, so replacing if land with if grid at new y, new x is equal to one. Then we have to go on and add this new y, new x land coordinate to the land hash set. So the way that we do that is like this. And last but not least, we have to add this new y and new x coordinate to the queue. All right, so now let's go ahead and run this code against the sample test cases to see if it works. And now we can run all of the test cases and our solution worked. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider liking or subscribing. It would really mean the world to me. That's it for me. I'll see you next time.